Jay Bernie, and we're here with Dr. Sylvia Earle. Uh, Dr. Earle, it's so nice to have you in Buffalo, and uh, it, you were here at the Learning Sustainability Conference. Right. I want to ask you some broad questions first. Uh, the importance of the waters to the earth. Uh, tell us about that. <laughs> well, some people say that we should call Earth ocean instead of, you know, the whole planet is characterized by the existence of water. Uh, water is not uncommon throughout the universe, but to have a a place, a planet, that holds water the way this one does is, is unusual. Uh, look, look throughout our own solar system. We were so excited because we found a little bit of water on the moon and Mars and quite a lot perhaps on the moon of Jupiter, Europa, but it's frozen. Uh, a big chunk of ice covers Euro uh, Europa as far as we know. Here, liquid water in the temperature range that suits life, certainly suits us. Uh, there are a lot of alternatives out there, none of them very hospitable for the likes of human beings. Earth is, is where it's at, <laughs> as far as life is concerned. There may be life out there somewhere beyond our own little blue planet, but if there is life out there, water is there with it. It's a single non-negotiable thing that life requires. Is water in good shape on the planet? We have done some pretty terrible things to our life support system, air, land, and certainly water, what we're putting into the waters of the world. It, it, it's just absurd when you think of our life depending on water and then we treat it as the ultimate sewer. <laughs> we, we think that if we put things in the water, that whether it's rivers, lakes, streams, or the ocean, that somehow magically they're gone. That that will take care of the problem, whatever the problem is. Putting toxic chemicals used to be more of a problem in, in North America than it is today, but there's a lot of it still going on. The, to see the connections between what we do, even seemingly remote from the water that ultimately affects the streams, lakes, and, and the ocean. What we put on our backyards, our golf courses, our farms and fields, uh, whether it's excess fertilizer that means that nitrates accumulate in the groundwater and ultimately flow into the streams and the rivers and then the sea, or pesticides or herbicides or the oil that people, you know, use motor oil that they put down the drains and thinking that therefore it goes away, not realizing that this connects to the water system, fresh water and ultimately to the sea. Uh, yeah, we've done some terrible things. And, and also what we're taking out of the ocean and out of the lakes, out of the streams. It's another problem. We are the, well, people think of, and seem to worry about sharks as the ultimate predator, but we're the ultimate predator. And we, even with sharks, we take millions of sharks every year. We get worried because every once in a while they take a bite out of one of us. But we take a lot of bites out of them, and not just sharks either. A million, a hundred million tons wildlife gets extracted out of the ocean, close to it every year. Earlier today you were talking about sustainable fisheries and how you believe there probably aren't sustainable fisheries. Obviously there's a lot of cultures on the planet that, that get their sustenance from right. fish. What can we do about that? The real problems today come not so much from those locally who are trying to feed their families and communities, although as our numbers grow, <laughs> there comes a point where that, even that is not realistic as it might have been 10,000 years ago, or even 500 years ago, even 50 years ago, when our numbers were somewhat smaller and their numbers were somewhat larger. But, you know, there's no free lunch. As, as our populations continue to expand, it is at the expense of other creatures. And there's a point beyond which they simply cannot take the amount of extraction that we are trying to impose on them. Now we talk about sustainability, but somebody has to face up to the fact that the way we're going about it in the ocean, it, it is simply not sustainable. And maybe it's, a, it's just a, a dream to think that it ever could be, given what we're now trying to impose on these natural wild systems. The theories look enchanting on paper, but the realities are devastating. We've tried to manage ourselves in such a way. We call it managing the fish. We don't ever manage a wild population of anything. 
we have to really think about managing ourselves and our behavior and what we extract from these systems. But we've always been way over the edge in terms of how much we think we can get away with. I suspect there is some number, but it's very small, about what we could take from a good, healthy population. But there aren't many of these good, healthy populations remaining because everything connects to everything else. And where we you know, tug and pull and create a problem over here, it resonates throughout the system in ways that we're not very good at evaluating. And we think optimistically that, okay, we've got a problem here, but this looks pretty good over there, so let's try and extract over here. And very soon, the same thing happens over here. This has been going on now for more than 100 years, but the pace has picked up in the last 20 years, 25 years, as we get new technologies, new markets, new ways of, of shipping under good conditions, creatures that once had to be consumed locally because you couldn't get them across, you know, 100 miles, let alone 1,000 miles across the country or 3,000 or all the way to the other side of the planet. Now, fish that are taken from the North Atlantic a few hours later are in Japan because there's a market for it over there and it's worth the while of those who are catching and marketing the fish to go to the expense of transporting them swiftly to the other side of the planet. Not because they're feeding starving millions, but because there's a luxury market for high quality, unusual kinds of, of protein that at this point in time people can afford to buy. You know, you ask about sustaining eco uh, countries or, or people and with the suggestion perhaps that they've done this for, for generations. But we're talking about greatly increased numbers of people trying to take from a, po a wild population that is not growing commensurate with the demands put upon them. and. <laughs> the biggest problems are not even so what's taken and consumed locally, it's what's being taken and shipped elsewhere in the world to people who are consuming not because they're really hungry, not because the lack of, of these creatures would somehow impact their survival. It's a luxury market that is the biggest worry of all. In Buffalo, New York, we're in the Buffalo River watershed, the Niagara River watershed, the yes. Lake Erie watershed. We're part of the Great Lakes uh, bioregion. How can we begin to think about our impacts and how can we be, because we're, we're working hard to try to figure right. out our place in the planet and how we can affect more sustainable issues on a global scale. Obviously, we have to act locally. How do we do that? How, how does a community, it's an old industrial community that's trying to have some sort of economic resurgence, how, how, do, we, how do we go to the next level? What's encouraging to see in a microcosm what's happening here, to realize that people are facing up to the limits of how you can stress the natural systems upon which we are all ultimately dependent, and to try to get it right. And it's that spirit of first recognizing that there's a problem, that's the first big step, and then really earnestly trying to do something about it. Um, my mom always used to coach my brothers and me to try to leave the place better than we found it. And in my case, it's usually after seeing the disaster that was my room. You know, you're supposed to leave the place better than you found it. But on a broader scale, if people individually, as well as in a community, and it starts with every individual, of course, what is it that you're doing or that you could be doing that can leave the place better than you found it? And it, it has to do with simple things like, what are you putting on your lawn? Or do you have a lawn at all? Have you decided to make the break and consider doing something else, like planting things that don't require fertilizer, pesticides, herbicides, or whatever else it is you put on your lawn? But rather to think wildflowers, or think leaves, and bushes, and trees. Think about what the natural landscape looks like and, and replicate it insofar as you can in a, in a labor-free way, and once you get it in place, it should take care of itself and give you the gift not only of, of birds and other wildlife that might be attracted, but the gift of time that you don't have to be out there mowing the lawn because it's, um, 
it's a restoration, even on a small scale, of what this part of the world was, was like when things were in better tune, better harmony. And if we're trying to reestablish some kind of harmony and find an enduring place for ourselves within these natural systems and to give nature a break where you can, let the restoration processes, sometimes some help is needed because we've done away with the ingredients, we've cut so many of the trees, but a supply of native trees is not close at hand and nature won't just immediately spring back unless we, or at least we may help the process a bit. With respect to water, think about water use on an individual basis. Again, think about where it goes once it <laughs> leaves your driveway or leaves your drain. Um, just so many intelligent, personal things that everybody can do, but then as a community to think about how the life support system of this community operates, what comes into it, what goes out of it. What do we do with the garbage that's generated here? It doesn't just go away. Everybody can live more lightly in terms of how we use the resources that we require for our survival, but not just to create the, the, the ingredients that have made us the throwaway society. You know, it's, I wish I had really ABC straight answers to your straight questions, but it, it is somewhat more personal in, the, in, in my response anyway. I think people, everybody should hold up a mirror and say, okay, what, what can I do? <laughs> because some people have talents that are special, like, I don't know, some people have a way with numbers. They can be extremely useful in terms of trying to evaluate the natural systems that support a community, a region, a country, and put that talent to work in terms of trying to find the right ways to um, working with the economy and understanding that we have to value the natural systems and put numbers on it and try to get it right. Some have a way with music. Some have a way with words. Some just care passionately and want to share their passion with others. I, I advise grown-ups to go get a kid, take them out into some good wild, and I like the idea of a wet place. And if you don't have a child of your own, go borrow one. There's nothing more inspirational than seeing the world through the eyes of a kid. To find, again, the kid that's right here inside of you. And to have that sense of wonder that kids have naturally, and that a lot of grown-ups do too, but somehow we have a tendency to lose it and get so overwhelmed with the day-to-day -day business of living that we forget to just stop and appreciate where air comes from, um, or to look at a, a bird or a butterfly, or think about the ground that you're walking on and understand that that is the distillation of four and a half billion years of history. And to appreciate the fact that we're here, surviving on this little blue and white planet, green too, was, you know, whatever it takes to make this planet work. And if you go not very far away from our atmosphere, it's a pretty hostile universe out there and that we ought to protect these things as if our life depended on it, because our life does, you know. <laughs> Jane, could you move it a little bit closer? Just to, uh, just go wider, and I just want to get the microphone a little bit closer. I mean, get comfortable. Right. Well, I can't get both of you. <laughs> Sorry, you don't have to get both of us when, when you know, you can start with me. Yeah. yeah. I want to change the tenor of the conversation just a little bit. You're a deep ocean explorer. You're, uh, you work in the deep oceans uh, explorer Deep, okay, let's start again. <laughs> You're a deep ocean explorer. You, know, you work at the National Geographic Society uh, as uh, in the Office of Deep Ocean Explorations, correct? Uh, what attracted you in the first place to oceans and deep ocean research? Well, when I was a little girl living in New Jersey, that's where my parents grew up, they had life as, as children themselves on little Jersey farms. Getting to the ocean was a treat, and it was for me as a kid. We lived about 40 miles away on a little farm, my brothers and I. So when we would go to the sea, it really inspired me. I, I looked forward to being able to, first of all, smell the ocean, 
you could, and it was a wonderful kind of salty air aroma. And then I could hear the ocean, the waves crashing on the beach along the Jersey Shore. And then finally, finally, we'd come over that last dune, and you could see the ocean. And I couldn't wait to get out, take off my shoes, and run down the beach, get my feet wet. When I was three years old, I got knocked over by a wave, and the ocean really got my attention. <laughs> And I found it exhilarating. So I guess at first I was scared because I couldn't breathe, and I was. All, but finally, I, I thought, "Yes, this is good," and I jumped back in, and that was it for me. The ocean has been an attraction ever since. But what really has held my attention, as much as I just love the the water and all that it embraces, it's the life in the ocean that really is the key. It's a key to what makes the ocean the ocean. It's a key to what makes this planet work. Life in the sea. The history of life on Earth is written in the lives of creatures that are still there. I mean, you should think about how Earth has had such a long history, four and a half billion years, we think, and life has been around for probably four billion years of that, maybe more, who knows exactly, but a long time, mostly microbial. Multicellular life didn't really start getting up and running until a little more than half a billion years ago, 600 million or so years ago, multicellular life. But we see in the ocean creatures that appeared in the fossil record 500 million years ago, 400 million, 300 million years ago. You can take a walk through time or swim through time by jumping into the nearest ocean. I mean, there are jellyfish, and there are sponges, and there are arthropods of many sorts, crabs and shrimps and, and the like. Horseshoe crabs along the New Jersey shore when I was a kid just absolutely captured my imagination. These are creatures that have somehow survived relatively unchanged over hundreds of millions of years, nearly 400 million years. These creatures have been around relatively unchanged. Only three species that remain, I guess four species now, in the world, one in the Atlantic and three in the Pacific along the shores of Asia. And there used to be many variations on the theme. But they're just one example. Again, look, taking this walk through the history of life, there, there are echinoderms, starfish and the like, um, many variations on the theme of, quotes, worms. There are peanut worms, there are arrow worms, there are flat worms, there are round worms. You know, some 30 to 35 phyla, big divisions of animals, nearly all of them have some representation in the sea. Only about half occur on land. So talk about diversity of life on Earth. Go to the ocean. That's where the action is. There's some very unusual life forms in the deep ocean also, around vents, for instance, uh, that just have totally different biological systems. We think of life in the deep sea around the hydrothermal vents as being really unusual. But I suppose if we interviewed them, they say, you're not going to believe these creatures that actually you know, they live out of the water. <laughs> and they, they have legs and they walk around. <laughs> I mean, they probably think terrestrial primates are the most bizarre things that the planet has ever thought up. And very rarely we visit them. <laughs> and you're, you have gone uh, pretty darn deep in an untethered vehicle, probably deeper than any other person on the planet. What's it like to be in that kind of environment, alone? What, what's it feel like? What, what? It, going into the ocean, especially deep in the ocean. It's just a wonderful, exhilarating experience, and I recommend it for everybody. I do. Um, a project that I've been involved with now uh, in, for the last four years called the Sustainable Seas Expeditions has made it possible for me, working with the National Geographic and with support from the Goldman Fund in San Francisco and working with NOAA and NASA and other agencies, we've been able to make it possible for more than 100 people to do what I do, that is get in a little submarine and learn how to drive them. And half of those people have really used these little subs called deep workers to go out and explore the ocean. Some of them go down to more than 1,000 feet. Some go to the full depth, 2,000 feet, and do what I have the pleasure of doing. I really look forward to the day when we have something like a Hertz Rent-A-Sub so that you or anybody, if you have a yen to go where people are not designed by nature to go. I mean, you can hire an airplane and go high, high in the sky. We're not designed by nature to do that either. But in so doing, we've gained a perspective of the world 
that we otherwise never could have. It opened the way for us to have a perspective to go up into space and look back on Earth as this hold in your arms planet that is characterized by blue. If we can similarly come to the time when people take easily and take for granted in the sense they can go down and explore the ocean and look back from the inside out and, and see what's happening, see what we're doing. I have great hopes that if we can get people acquainted with the nature of the ocean and what's happening there, we'll do a much better job of taking care of it. But imagine this. There you are in your little sub, a dome over your head. You're seated as I am now in this nice comfortable seat legs down a metal tube, but feet sitting, uh, actually put on uh, pedals that drive the submarine. So your right foot, if you want to go down, you press the accelerator <laughs> pedal down and you go forward just like driving a car. The harder you push, the faster you go forward. If you want to go in reverse, you don't shift gears, you just put your heel down and you'll go in reverse. Again, a light touch takes you slowly, you jam it down hard and you go in reverse well, not fast, two or three knots is maximum speed, two or three miles an hour. If you want to go to the left or right, you swing your toes left or right. If you want to go up or down, that's what your left foot does. That's your up-down foot. It's really simple. Like driving a golf cart, except a golf cart can't go vertically. You know, it's really just, you know, and you don't have a steering wheel. You steer with your toes. But it's so simple that even a scientist can operate it and still have enough brain power left over to uh, to make observations. We've had teachers, journalists, administrators, governmental managers come in and fly off into the blue and get a feel for what the fish are doing by being down there with them. A lot of times we talk to our audience and our audience is often composed of children, kids. And I want to ask another big picture question. Yeah. Explore. Why, why do we need to explore? Oh, ask a kid. Kids know the answer to that question. They're, they're natural explorers. They're always turning over rocks. They're always looking around corners. It's the nature of human beings. We are curious critters. Kids can't be stopped. It's why, how, what, when, where. The barrage of questions you get from two and three and four year olds. If we just kept that mindset all our lives, and some people do, they're called scientists. They're just kids who never quite grew up. Explorers, the same thing. You, uh, where people somehow go astray and tend to suppress that questioning, that sense of wonder, I don't know, but bless children for having it. Uh, it it's something, I guess, about the nature of, of the way societies work that no sooner have children begun to learn how to walk and talk, and we're telling them to sit down and shut up. <laughs> but to the extent that they've got some freedom to explore and to ask questions, to be encouraged to, and, and not discouraged from saying, why, why, why? They want to know. I want to know. Sometimes there aren't answers, and that's OK, because what if all the questions were answered? It would be a very boring world to know that you could look up everything that, that there ever that you ever might want to know. The wondrous thing is that each new answer leads to a hundred new questions that we just keep pulling back layers and layers of understanding. And it's the best hope we have for a bright and prosperous future for humankind, that we keep asking those questions and keep finding new answers. I want to ask you one last question. Uh, we are today one month removed from the World Trade Center bombing, the Pentagon bombing. Right. How does that affect the world, the oceans, the waters? What can we look forward to and what do we have to do now? I guess the question yeah. is how, how has it changed? Oh, the world, no, without question, our human world has been given a sharp nudge of trying to reevaluate where we've come from, where are we going, in light of some problems that have been there all along, but we just weren't aware of it. We were complacent. In a sense, this is what's happening with the natural world as, as well. We have, we're very complacent about 
things that we take for granted in our life support system, but there are some real terrors out there awaiting us in the future unless we shape up and address them. I mean, the water issue. Can you imagine just as many people as we're now trying to support double that on the same amount of water that we now have? We, we have to imagine it because it's there, it's in front of us. Can you imagine the consequences of looking at the natural systems upon which we are dependent in a state of collapse trying to support twice our numbers or even our existing numbers because they are, the, the systems are becoming unraveled, they're eroding. So the quality of life that we would like to maintain and see others enjoy, maintain in, in North America and parts of Europe, Australia, it's a it's a dream to be able to, to live well for, for people everywhere. But if we're to live at all, we have to take care of the natural systems that take care of us. It is conceivable that some terrible things, whether it's disease, whether it's changing climate that is very disruptive to our agricultural systems, whether it's a, a continued collapse of natural systems that ultimately generate oxygen that, again, we're dependent on. Who knows where the pivotal points are, really. We're, we're increasingly conscious of some of these things in terms of global warming issues, in terms of ozone depletion, in terms of collapsing fish populations, in terms of the, the loss of the forest cover, a lot of the, and, and the release of, of new and dangerous microbes upon populations that are now nicely gathered in places where, you know, we have developed, quotes, monocultures, high concentrations of human beings that to certain predators, and I mean microbial predators, wow, oh, it's like, wow, what a setup for plagues of sorts that human beings have unfortunately experienced in the past. So. I think as a consequence of what happened on September 11th, 2001, while we're right now concentrating on our fellow humans as the greatest concern, the terrorists that are out there have been there but are now activated in ways that we didn't imagine could possibly ever happen. Why would human beings do this to other human beings? But it may cause us as well to think in the, in the broadest terms about our survival, about our well-being. I, as you know, have been called a lot of different things, from her deepness to the Sturgeon General to you know, explorer in residence at the National Geographic. But I'm called one thing that I like most of all, and that's what my four grandsons call me. They call me G-Mom. It's through their eyes that I am most conscious about the impact of the 11th of September and the impact of humankind on this planet through my whole life. Seeing the changes that have taken place in the last 25 years, in the last 10 years, and then the last 30 days, I try to imagine what is it going to be like in the next 10, 20, 50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, because what we're doing right now will have a magnified impact on everything that follows, everything. I mean, we have to get it right with respect to getting along with our fellow human beings. This cannot be a religious upheaval, the likes of which we have known in the past on a smaller scale, where people with different cultures and different ideas clash catastrophically. We just cannot let that happen again. I don't know what it's going to take, but we just can't let it continue for, one, for the sake of all who follow. One thing it's probably going to take is for us all to take some responsibility. We can't just let our, our government, I mean, our government represents us, so yes. we, we have a lot of responsibility. And just remember that. I mean, if, if things are happening in your name, it's important that you at least know about it, and that's not always easy to do. Here we are at the eastern end of Lake Erie. Right. Uh, 
one of the largest freshwater resources on Earth, the Great Lakes, come through Buffalo, through the Niagara River. We face all of those problems that you're talking about, whether it's water use in other areas or the contamination or the loss of fisheries. Right. We're so pleased that you're here to talk with us today and help us talk about the global context and the local context. We have a lot of work to do and we need to do it now and it's just a real pleasure that you've come to, to talk with us about your perspectives and so thank you so much Dr. Sylvia Earle. Uh, I just thank you. pleased to meet you and know you. <laughs> You're an inspiration. Well, gee, thanks. So are you. <laughs> you and the people of this area, I'm really pleased to be here. We have a lot of work to do and uh, we need people like you to help us. Thank so you. Thanks. <laughs> thanks.